Again, welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. Tonight's topic is short beds and narrow covers. Just the title alone has probably aroused questions in your mind. Actually, the subject is relating to a text found in the Bible. We'll look at Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14. This text details a part of scripture that is so important that all other prophecies we've studied this far really don't mean a thing unless you and I understand what God is talking about when he deals with the question of short beds and narrow covers. Kenneth Cox's presentation tonight is regarding your individual salvation. I promise tonight's topic will answer one of the most important questions in scripture, an answer you don't dare miss. So let's go directly to the meeting where Pastor Cox is eager to tell you about short beds and narrow covers. I'm very happy to welcome each of you back again this evening. As a boy of nine years old, we moved from Chicago, Illinois, to Oklahoma. Moved out on the farm, and it fell my responsibility to take care of a fireplace. My father gave me that responsibility, and I didn't think much of it. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever had to get up early in the morning on very cold winter days and get a fire going in the fireplace. I dreaded to hear my father say, Kenneth, get up, build a fire. And I uh, just, you know, didn't like it, almost freeze to death. And I'd do everything I could at night to bank the fire, to make sure there were some hot coals there in the fireplace so it wouldn't take long to get a fire going. Just did everything I could. But as the years have passed, I've grown very fond about a fireplace, and we have one in our home, and I enjoy it very much. But the house that we lived in only had the fireplace in the living room, had a cook stove in the kitchen, and that was all the sources of heat in the house. And in the part of Oklahoma that we lived in, it can get as cold as 10 below on a cold winter day, you know. And so my mother would go around and she would shut the bedroom doors because the fireplace and the cook stove just wouldn't heat the whole house. So she would shut the bedroom doors to keep the rest of the house warm so that we could live there. And I don't know how many of you have ever gone to bed in a bedroom that hasn't had any heat all day. You know, those sheets are just exactly like ice. And you crawl in between those sheets and you think you're going to freeze to death. And you don't, once you get that spot warm, you don't dare move the rest of the night. Well, that was, that was pretty much the situation as a boy. Now, I have a brother that's three years older than I and we shared the same bed. Didn't have very many bedrooms, and so Don and I had to sleep in the same bed. And Don, when he would go to bed at night, he would reach over and he would take the cover in this hand and he would pull it under this shoulder. And sometime during the night, he would do this. And I would wake up in the morning almost froze to death. The cover was just never wide enough. It was always too narrow. Never was wide enough. And then I can remember when I reached the teens. You know that time in your life when you grow a foot in one year? You know the time I'm talking about? It just seemed like almost overnight and the bed became too short. Just wasn't long enough. Well, the Bible talks about short beds and narrow covers in this evening. I'm going to go to the scripture here and I'm going to read you several verses out of the book of Isaiah, the 28th chapter, and I want you to listen very carefully to what it says because it has a great message to us today. Isaiah, the 28th chapter, let's notice what it says about short beds and narrow covers. We're going to start with about, oh, verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said we have made a covenant with death. Now, here are these men of Israel. They've made a covenant with death, and with Shiloh, or the grave, we are in agreement. 
When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge. Terrible. I mean, it says they're in agreement with the grave, with hell. They've made lies their refuge. Under falsehoods we have hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation. See, he's going to lay in Zion a stone for a foundation. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line. Listen carefully. And righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. The water will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with Shiloh will, be, will not stand. And when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning it will pass over, by day and by night it will be a terror just to understand the report. And then you come to verse 20, and it says this, For the bed is too short for a man to stretch out on, and the covering so narrow that he cannot wrap himself in it. Now, what's God talking about? What does this short beds and narrow covers have to do with these men, these scornful men of Israel that have made lies their refuge, that have made an agreement with hell, that they have done all these things. What is God talking about here? When he said, all these things you've done is like short beds, narrow covers. Now, I want us to go back, and I want us to look at a few of those texts as we see what God is talking about here. Isaiah 28, 17 also, I will make justice the what? The measuring line. Now, he said, I'm going to make justice the measuring line. And then he says, and righteousness the plummet. You understand what a plummet is, right? You know, that's that string with the weight on the end of it where they can get exact spot, all right? The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. The water will overflow the hiding place. Now, what God is saying when he says, I'm going to take and I'm going to make justice the measuring line. You cannot have justice without some kind of a standard, can you? I mean, if you're going to have justice, you're going to have to have some kind of measuring. You can't just have justice without law. You're going to have to set down some laws if you're going to have justice. So when he says, I'm going to make justice the measuring line, he's saying he's going to take his law, and with the law, he's going to measure everything out. Now, I want us to look just for a moment at the law and what God has to say about his law. It says, so speak, in James 2, so speak and so do is those who will be judged by the what? The law of liberty. So the scripture says very clearly, that all of us are going to be judged by the law of liberty. Everybody. Now, that law of liberty described here in James, the second chapter, is talking about the Ten Commandments. And he says, I'm going to make justice the measuring line. I'm going to judge you by my law. Now, if God's going to judge us with his law, then it might be well that we took just a moment to see what God's law is like what the Scripture has to say about God's law. Romans 7, verse 12, Therefore the law is, what? Holy. The law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. So when God looks at his law, he says the commandments are holy, they're just, they're good. It goes on in Psalms and says the law of the Lord is Perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So God says simply that his law is holy, it's just, it's good, it's perfect. Not anything wrong with God's law. No way. It's perfect. So if we're going to take a look at this law that God says, I'm going to use the law as my measuring line, justice, 
to the measuring line. That law is holy, just, good, and perfect. That's what the Scripture says. Now, what does the Lord expect out of you and me? What does he expect you to be? What does he expect me to be? Well, Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 48 says, Therefore you shall be... I didn't hear that very loud. Therefore ye shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a pretty tall order. Now, if that text would have said, Kenneth, I want you to be perfect like Kurt is, I would have said, maybe I got a chance. That isn't what it says. It says, be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You seen anybody like that lately? Huh? Asked that one night and had a fellow raise his hand. And I said, you've seen somebody perfect? He said, yeah. And I said, you know somebody's perfect? He said, yes. And I said, who is that? And he said, my wife's first husband. <laughs> you know, so maybe there are some people, but uh, it says, be ye therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. God doesn't stop there, folks. He doesn't stop there. Listen. Just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God says, I want you to be holy. I want you to be perfect. I want you to be without blame. Man, that's a tall order. I mean, that's what he says. That's what he says we should be. And he said, I'm going to tell you something else. He said, I'm going to judge you with a law that is holy, just, good, and perfect. That's how I'm going to judge you. And you are to be holy without blame and perfect. That's what he's saying. In Isaiah, we're going back to Isaiah 28. Now listen carefully. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Now, he says that in Zion, he's going to lay a stone, a precious stone, a cornerstone. Do you know who that's talking about? Now, it's talking about Jesus Christ in the book of Peter. Peter says that Christ was that stone, that he is that cornerstone. That's what Peter said. Christ is that cornerstone. And he said, listen, in Zion, I'm going to lay a stone, a cornerstone. Now, that's very important when it talks about a cornerstone because that has a lot to do with the measuring line and the plummet. I hope you're putting some things together has a lot to do with that. When he talks about Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, as the precious stone, now let's go back to Isaiah 28 again and look at another text here. Also I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. The water will overflow the hiding place. Now, years ago, folks, they use cornerstones in buildings. Uh, we don't do that much today. We see cornerstones in buildings, and they have the architect's name on it and the builder's name on it, but that wasn't the purpose of cornerstones. Originally, cornerstones were put in buildings because every measurement of the building was taken off the cornerstone. The weight of the building rested on the cornerstone. That stone was put in there with great care because every measurement was taken. Now, you have seen, you've watched a brick mason lay brick or block, and you've seen him take and pull that line until it was taunt. And then he laid those stone right along that line. That's what it's talking about here when he says, I'm going to make justice the measuring line. Who do you think he's pulling that measuring line off of? The cornerstone, Jesus Christ. 
That's who he's pulling that line off of. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm going to compare your righteousness to the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. He said, I'm going to lay it right to the line. I'm going to make it exact. I'm not going to deviate. It's got to line up perfectly. That's what he's saying. In fact, he even says he will judge you by Jesus Christ. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So it says he's going to lay it right to the line. He's going to make it exact. He will not deviate. He's going to put it right to the plummet. I mean, that's to the very point. That's what he expects out of us. You say... Man, I don't think I'm going to measure up. Don't think I'm going to quite measure up. Just hang on, because he has more to say. Revelation 21, 27, it says, And there shall by no means enter in anything that, what? Defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It says that nothing's going to enter into heaven that defiles. I feel like all I'd have to do is just take one step inside and I'd defile it. But I'm talking about what the law demands, what God expects of you and me. Now, I find a lot of people that try to get around that many, many different ways. They try to deal with it in every way. And we're going to take a few minutes to take a look at the Scripture and see what the Scripture says about each one of us and what we're like. David said this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. David said that he was born into this world with a nature... That is sinful. It's the way he came into the world. That's the way we are. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand what they're fighting against. A lot of people don't understand the very principles of the gospel. I hear people out here preaching all kinds of things, and they don't understand the basic fact of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says here that these individuals, you and I, each one of us, are born into this world that way. A lot of people don't understand their own nature. Kind of like the stinging scorpion. The stinging scorpion was trying to get around the lake. He had an appointment over on the other side of the lake. And he was running around the lake just as fast as his little legs could take him. But he realized he was never going to make it on time. Just wasn't going to get there on time. And as he was running around the lake, he came upon this turtle. And he stopped and he asked the turtle to give him a ride, said, give me a ride across the lake. And the turtle said, no. And the stinging scorpion said, listen, I have an appointment on the other side of the lake. It's important that I get there. Please help me. Give me a ride across the lake. And the turtle said, no. And the stinging scorpion said, listen, have some mercy on me, some compassion on me. Help me out. I need your help. And the turtle said, no. And the stinging scorpion said, why? Why won't you give me a ride across the lake? And he said, because you'll sting me. And the stinging scorpion said, I'm not going to sting you. That's not sensible. He said, if I was to sting you, why, you would drown and I'd be on your back and I would drown. That's not logical. That's not sensible. I'm not going to sting you. The turtle said, you sure? He said, positive. I'm not going to sting you. The turtle said, okay, get on. The sting the scorpion crawled up on his back and they started out across the lake. Got about halfway and the old sting and scorpion let him have it right in the neck. And as the turtle was sinking, he cried out, Oh, why? Oh, why did you do it? The sting the scorpion said, I don't know. It's just my nature. And that's what's wrong with you and I. See? We, we are that way. God said, listen. He said, I want you to be perfect holy, without blame, before me in love. That's what I want of you. But my nature is not that way. 
You see, you and I just find ourselves doing things that we don't understand many times. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them perfect. I mean, they were perfect. And then you remember the old devil tempted Eve, and she ate of the fruit and gave it to Adam. Adam ate. And the Scripture says, because they ate that death passed upon the whole human race. Therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. When Adam sinned and Eve sinned, death passed on the whole human race. And you say, Brother Cox, that's not fair. Just because Adam and Eve sinned, why does that affect me? Why should I die because they sinned? Well, I want to ask you a question tonight. How old would you be tonight if your grandfather had died when he was three years old? Huh? I see some of you shaking your head. The other rest of you don't know? Well, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be around if your grandfather had died when you were three years old because your grandfather has something to do with you being here. You understand that? Well, you better believe what Adam and Eve did has something to do with your condition. Just don't think that it doesn't. Death passed upon the whole human race because Adam and Eve sinned. And we find ourselves doing things that sometimes we don't even understand. What has it been? Three weeks ago now, my son got married. Uh, you know how that goes, don't you? Especially when they're courting. You know, I, I have never been able to understand that because, you know, they always look so nice. Bless his wife's heart. She always looks like she just came out of the band box, you know, just everything. And they always have the best foot forward, and they're always doing such lovely things and nice things with each other and all that. You know how that goes? And then, you know, they have the wedding. And boy, it all changes. We begin to see each other, and we see how we actually are. All of a sudden, we begin to see things about one another we never knew existed before. It's the way we are. In fact, the Scripture says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's a lot of things that you and I do. You know why? Huh? Because we want to. Just because we want to. In fact, I run on to some of the saints who sometimes tell me, Oh, I never do anything willfully. Man, I wished I didn't. I wished I didn't. And you be very careful. Don't let me ask you too many questions or you might find yourself doing some things willfully. You know, we do things. God said, listen, I want you to be holy. I want you to be perfect. I want you to be without blame. That's what he wants us to be. And I find people doing all kinds of things because we are this way, trying to overcome that, hoping that some way they would be different. It says here, for we know that the law is what? Spiritual. The law was holy, just, good, perfect. Not anything wrong with the law. I find people jumping on the law, attacking God's law. There's nothing wrong with God's law, folks. The problem's not there. The problem's with us. It says the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal, sold under sin. You know what carnal means, don't you? Huh? We read those words, and I don't even think people know what they're talking about. You know what carnal is? Well, come on now, folks. You've eaten chili con carne, haven't you? It's flesh. I'm flesh. That's my nature. It is not spiritual. It's flesh. That's the way we are. It's what it's talking about. 
That's the problem. The problem's not with the law. The problem's with us. And because we are that way, I find people going out, this man, you remember Christ talked about him, said that this publican walked into the temple, felt so bad. I mean, he just felt horrible. Wouldn't even hardly be seen, got over in the corner, just beat on his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Felt so horrible, unworthy. And a little bit in the temple walked this Pharisee. Oh, he didn't get over the corner. He walked out in the middle. Stood there and looked everybody over. Over there was that publican in the corner looked up into the heavens and said, God, I sure am thankful I'm not like that fella. And the scripture says that the sinner, the publican, went down to his house justified, not the Pharisee. Some people have this idea that if I do certain things, I'm going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. I run on to people that have the idea that their good works will get them into the kingdom of heaven. I, I visit with people. I go visit somebody and they'll tell me, oh, I really don't think I need to go to church. I'm just as good as John Doe down the street. Well, the truth of it is you might be better than John Doe down the street. But that's not going to get you into heaven. That won't get you into heaven at all. Oh, I'm a good neighbor. I, I, I help my neighbors, help my friends. I'm really a good person. That won't save you, friend. You want to see what the Scripture says about it? Listen. As it is written, there is how many righteous? None righteous, no, not one. Get it down. None righteous, no, not one. They have all gone out of the way. They together have become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. It even says the good things that we do aren't really good. You don't need to raise your hands. Don't want anybody to raise their hands. I just want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever done something good for the wrong reason? Say, even, even our best motives sometimes are tainted. In fact, it goes on and says, but we are all like an unclean thing. All our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. Our iniquity like the wind have taken us away. This is the way we are. And I find that there are a lot of people trying to get into heaven some other way, just like these men in the Scripture. Short beds, narrow covers. Trying to figure out some way that they're going to get into heaven other than what the Scripture says. They've made lies their refuge. They're in agreement with hell. And the Lord said, listen, all that's going to be wiped away that's like short beds, narrow covers. And dear friend, I want to tell you tonight, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, everything else is short beds and narrow covers. You're not going to get there any other way. The only way you and I will get there will be through Jesus Christ. There's just no other way. You see, it took, Jesus Christ, to meet the demands of the law. You see, the law demands two things of you. Did you know that? First thing it demands of you is perfection. The law will not settle for anything less than perfection. I don't care whether it's God's law or man's law. It doesn't settle for anything less than perfection. You mean to tell me if I go out here tonight and I run the stoplight down at the corner here, and the cop pulls me over and he said, didn't you see that stoplight? And I say, yes, sir, I saw it. 
He'd say, well, why didn't you stop? And I said, now, officer, listen. I stop at that stoplight 99 times out of 100. I just run it 1% of the time. What do you think he's going to do? Going to write me a ticket. See, because the law requires every time. The law won't settle for anything less than 100%. The second thing that the law demands is if you break it, you're going to pay a penalty. And if you break God's law, do you know what the penalty is? Penalty's death. It says the wages of sin is death. Christ came to meet the demands of the law. First, the law demands that you and I, each one, be holy, we be perfect, we be without blame. We are not that way. So Jesus said, I'll come and I will live a perfect life for you. And it says here in Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He lived an absolutely perfect life. He never sinned, not even one time, so much as in thought. Secondly, you'll find that he paid the price. He died. He lived such a perfect life that he said that the devil couldn't even find anything wrong with him. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has what? Nothing in me. The devil couldn't find one thing wrong with him. Lived an absolute perfect life. Now, how does that help you? How does that help you? How does that help me? Well, I mentioned to you that uh, my son just got married. The Bible talks about a wedding, a special wedding. It says that this king called a wedding supper for his son. Went out and invited people to come. I want you to listen to what it says about it. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So it says they've sent a whole group out, and they said, come to the wedding. And so they've gone out and invited these people to the wedding. Listen to who comes. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both, what? Bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. What kind of people? Bad and good. Well, that's not the way I hear the saints praying sometimes. I hear them say, Lord, please remember the honest in heart. What about the dishonest? Aren't they to be saved? Says he went out here and he, they invited both bad and good and the wedding was filled with guests. Now it so happened that this king decided that everybody that came to the wedding he was going to give a garment to, a wedding garment. Everybody that came in received a wedding garment from the king. Didn't cost you anything. It was free. So when the place was filled with guests, the king decided that he would come in and he would take a look at the guest. But when the king came to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on the wedding garment. This old boy here, you see, he said, thank you, I don't need it. In fact, I bought this tuxedo just for this occasion. I, I, I did the very best I could. I, I have my own clothes. I, I've really dressed up for this occasion, and uh, I don't need the king's garment. Thank you just the same. And so there he stands at the wedding in his own tuxedo. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without the wedding garment? And he was speechless. What are you going to tell a king? You ever thought about that? You know, what do you say to a king? I don't like yours. You don't tell kings that. Couldn't say, I couldn't afford it. It was free. I mean, he didn't have to pay anything for it. The king gave it absolutely free. But he didn't want it. He wanted his own. And so the king says this, 
Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, dear friend, what I'm telling you is you see that law, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm going to make that the measuring line. I'm going to lay justice to the line, righteousness to the plummet. I'm going to compare your righteousness to the righteousness of my son. The only way you're going to make it is if you put on the garment of his righteousness. I guarantee you, dear friend, if you think you're going to stand in the garment of your own, you're in trouble. It's when we put on the garment of Christ's righteousness, then that righteousness compares to his son. It's perfect, it's holy, it's just, it's good. Not anything wrong with that righteousness. And that's the only way we'll stand. We won't make it any other way. Don't misunderstand me. When you put on the garment of Christ's righteousness, certain things happen in your life. To put on the garment of his righteousness, this will of mine has to be surrendered to him. My thoughts have to be in captivity to his thoughts. I must be willing to let him guide and direct my life. That happens to be how you put on the garment of his righteousness. It's by surrendering your will to his. When we do that, then he covers us, and the scripture says this is what happens. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are what? Covered. All my sins, all the things that I have done wrong are covered with his righteousness. Oh, how wonderful. I can tell you there's nothing in the world like that, friend. I'm so glad that the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say, Kenneth Cox, if you can't perform perfectly, there's no hope for you. I'm thankful he doesn't say that covers me with his righteousness. And I don't know about you, dear friend, but boy, that took all the guilt away, that took all the burden away, and it set me free. Did that. Because it was his righteousness made all the difference in the world. Also says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. All the things that I've done wrong is taken away, no condemnation. I stand before him in his righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How do I accept that? Very quickly, let me tell you how to accept that. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. That's the way you do it. The just shall live by faith. No other way, dear friend. Not by my performance. My performance is a result of faith. It's by faith, the faith in Jesus Christ that makes all the difference in the world in our life. You remember Nicodemus came to Jesus, spoke to him at night. And as Jesus was talking to him, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, Lord, I don't understand. I don't know what you mean. I'm an old man. Are you saying I've got to be born of my mother again? And Jesus responded by saying, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And Nicodemus said, Lord, I still don't understand. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus gave him an illustration. Jesus said this to him, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Nicodemus' mind went back 
went back to the time that the children of Israel were there in the wilderness. When they were there in the wilderness, God said to them, you need to go this way. The children of Israel looked over there and they said, looks pretty rough that way, Lord. Looks a lot smoother this way. Why, why there, there's not near as much problems this way. The Lord said, no, I want you to go that way. And they said, Lord, there's mountains over there. The way's hard that way, Lord. It's nice this way. It's not, it's not rough at all, Lord. It wouldn't be hard. It'd be easy to go that way. The Lord said, no, I want you to go this way. And they said, Lord, listen, they tell us there's giants over there. We don't think there's any giants this way. The Lord said, no, I want you to go this way. And they said, sorry, Lord, we're going to go this way. And they went that way. I mean, they started out that way. And as they went that way, the Scripture says that serpents begin to come into the camp. Poisonous serpents that begin to bite the people and the people begin to die. And they went running to Moses and they said, Moses, help us, help us, do something for us. And Moses prayed and God said, Moses, make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole and stand it up in the camp of Israel and tell the people they'll look on it, they'll live, they'll not die. What in the Bible does the serpent represent? Represent sin. Jesus Christ became sin for every one of you here tonight. He took upon himself your sins. He bore your sins. He died in your place. He paid your debt. And what I'm telling you tonight, that I don't care what you've done, I don't care what sin you've committed tonight, if you will just look up, at Jesus Christ and accept him, you'll live, you'll not die. That it promises. You can have life in Jesus Christ. You can live. You don't have to die. Find righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid your debt. He died in your place. Oh, dear friends, he's willing to take your sins and make them just as white as snow I want you to listen as Steve sings.